Only one of these two people is going to be the next president. But which one's going to be better for Bitcoin? The answer might not be what you think. Let's mine deep. At first glance, Donald Trump seems like the obvious pick for Bitcoin enthusiasts. He's mentioned firing Gary Gensler. I will fire Gary Gensler and appoint a new SEC chairman. Discussed the possibility of creating a federal Bitcoin reserve and even became the first presidential candidate to spend Bitcoin. Crazy. By rolling back regulations and encouraging innovation, Trump could make it easier for Bitcoin to function as real money in the US. His administration would likely foster an environment where Bitcoin miners could thrive and where Bitcoin could operate as a true medium of exchange, not just a store of value. But here's a contrarian angle here. Camilla might be more bullish for Bitcoin, though not in the way that you might expect. Kamala Harris and the Democratic Party have strong backing from powerful financial institutions like BlackRock, which has made major moves into Bitcoin through its Bitcoin ETF, one of its largest products ever. BlackRock has donated almost three times as much money to Democratic candidates over Republican candidates this election cycle. And BlackRock's co-founder is a known supporter of Harris. But if the Biden-Harris administration has been so openly hostile towards Bitcoin, like with Operation Chokepoint 2.0 and the mining moratoriums they have issued, how could more of Harris be a good thing for Bitcoin? Banks and other financial institutions crave regulatory clarity. With a clear legal framework under Harris, these institutions could integrate Bitcoin into their services more seamlessly potentially making Bitcoin more accessible to non-technical investors through Bitcoin ETFs or savings products. This walled garden approach could ensure that institutions profit, while regular users can only access Bitcoin through centralized platforms. Not really what Bitcoin was intended for, but we'll get to that in a minute. At the same time, Harris's fiscal policies would likely involve much more government spending and debt than a Republican administration, continuing the record inflationary pressures we've seen in the last four years. This, ironically, strengthens the case for Bitcoin. As fiat currencies lose value through inflation, Bitcoin's scarcity becomes an even more attractive hedge, aka the money printer is Bitcoin's best friend. So why should you care? The real question isn't just which candidate supports Bitcoin more, but how they would shape Bitcoin's future in America. Donald Trump's approach would likely be supportive, but hands off, encouraging experimentation and letting Bitcoin grow organically. This kind of environment could allow Bitcoin to flourish in America as money, with adoption coming from people seeking financial sovereignty. On the other hand, Kamala Harris would likely push for more regulatory clarity, creating an environment where Bitcoin gains legitimacy through institutions like banks. While this could centralize Bitcoin's use and access, potentially limiting its decentralized nature, this institutional demand could drive Bitcoin's price higher as more financial entities adopt it. Ultimately, Bitcoin's price is driven by supply and demand. The supply is fixed at 21 million. So the question is, which environment will produce more demand going forward? A supportive, hands-off government that allows innovation and experimentation, or a highly regulated environment where institutions dominate and drive up the price through structured financial products and a little bit of extra money printing. Do you believe in Bitcoin's roots as a decentralized, censorship-resistant asset, or do you see it maturing into a dominant global financial asset, where institutional demand drives its value higher? The decision is yours. Don't miss Eric Wise backstage. So how do you see Bitcoin influencing or reshaping existing power structures in society? That's a good question. It depends on how the existing power structures how quickly they react. So for example, nation states, if nation states, which are the ultimate power structure right now in our world, if they're forward thinking and they adopt Bitcoin, they'll maintain their power structure, but we could see some change. You could envision a country like uh, Turkey or Argentina or Venezuela, that's having tremendous currency problems and adopt printed their own currency while they still have one and bought a lot of Bitcoin. They'd go from being a powerless nation to a powerful nation. So there really is the potential for change. What role do you see Bitcoin playing in the future of global finance? I think Bitcoin literally is the future of global finance. Uh, and, you know, America is just the 
best house in a bad neighborhood. The dollar's fine, but we have massive inflation. Everybody's getting crushed. No one is immune to it. So there's nowhere to hide, you know? So the only place you can hide, the only way you can escape this system of inflation is to grab Bitcoin, which is the hardest asset in the world. But what do you believe is the biggest misconception about Bitcoin? I think the, generally the largest misconception about Bitcoin is that there's someone in control of it, there's someone who benefits more than you, that there's some kind of scam or it's some kind of thing where, uh, you know, you buying Bitcoin is going to benefit someone else too much. And the truth is, it's this virtuous feedback loop. It benefits everyone and it benefits mostly you for buying it. Of course, you're known as the man, you know, who is responsible for orange pilling Michael Saylor. Yeah. But who orange pilled you? You know, by, by nature of being in venture capital, you go to a lot of emerging technology conferences. And I just went to a Bitcoin conference in 2013 in Miami. And there was probably less than 100 people total at the conference. And it was everybody walking around with t-shirts saying they could help you set up their wallet. And that was really how I just got introduced to it. And I was just very curious about it and did a little research and got deeper and deeper. Orange pilling someone, you can only do so much. They have to be ready. And so with Michael, for example, with Michael Saylor, I tried for years to orange pill him. And for years, he had no interest in learning about Bitcoin. It was only when the pandemic hit, the world changed, everything was getting shut down that he had a need to look for. So he was looking to preserve his company's capital. And how do you envision Bitcoin impacting emerging markets and developing countries? Yeah, kind of like the example I just gave with like Venezuela or Argentina, you could be an emerging country that's in really bad shape right now. But if you, it's kind of like some of these, you know, companies, these little dead companies like a similar scientific, right? They were, you know, a zombie company. They embraced Bitcoin. Now they have vitality. Now they're not a zombie company anymore. Stocks gone up, they, they can issue more stock and debt and buy more Bitcoin. Same thing's gonna happen at the nation state level. Nation states that were out of favor, didn't have anything. If they embrace Bitcoin, they could become very powerful nations. What needs to happen in order for hyper-Bitcoinization to be th a thing? I don't know. I don't think much about hyper-Bitcoinization. I don't, I'm not looking forward to it. I don't know, I like the world. I like, I like currencies. I, I like governments. I like nation states. I think our power structure is, is okay with me. Um, it can always be improved dramatically. And I think Bitcoin can improve it. I don't think it needs to break anything for Bitcoin to win. I think just a store of value for the whole world is enough and we don't need to upset things too much to do that.